G'day and salutations. Today's briefing, Air Power Australia. What aircraft? How many? How good are they? As a result of the Defence Strategic Review, the DSR, see separate briefing link below, the Royal Australian Air Force, the RAAF or the RAF, must be optimised for operating in Australia's immediate region and for the security of sea lines of communication and maritime trade. The DSR recommended that the highest priority for the Air Force will be placed on the support of maritime, littoral and sustainment operations from Australia's northern base network. Unlike the Army and the Navy, the Air Force is not expected to change drastically as a result of the DSR, with one or two possible exceptions. This briefing will look at which aircraft are currently or soon to be operated by the Royal Australian Air Force, how many of each are to be procured, and the location of Australia's northern air bases. The most talked about aircraft in the Royal Australian Air Force, the RAAF, are the F-35A Lightning II strike flighters. While there has always been discussion about the RAAF getting the Stovall version, the F-35B, that was never a realistic option, but I won't be covering that here. The key capabilities that the F-35 brings, apart from stealth, are sensor fusion, it's the data integration and data management. It's active electronically scanned array, electro-optical targeting system and helmet mounted display provide enhanced situational awareness for the pilot. The F-35 can operate as an intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance asset and battle manager, sharing information with all networks, be they ground, sea or air. With an equal focus on fighter and strike roles, the F-35 is at its best when weapons are carried internally with heavier payloads being able to be delivered by other aircraft. However, weapons can be carried externally, but with the resultant impact on radar cross-section and range payload performance. The government has confirmed that the RAAF will receive the full planned acquisition of 72 F-35As, and not the 100 which is often mentioned. There was never a project for the RAF to acquire 100 F-35s, although there is the possibility that additional would have been purchased if the FA-18Fs were to be replaced. The two-seat FA-18F Super Hornet was originally purchased as an interim solution to cover the retirement of the F-111C long-range strike aircraft, but it has ended up being a long-term solution. As with the F-35, it is a multi-role aircraft, but with a focus on strike for the RAAF. It can carry a significant payload, but with a shorter combat radius when compared to comparative aircraft. Also a two-seat aircraft, the EA-18G Growler is an electronic warfare aircraft, a specialised version of the FA-18F. Unlike the 18F, there is no internal 20mm gun, and the wingtip stations are used for electronic warfare systems designed for airborne situational awareness and SIGINT or signals intelligence gathering. It's important to note that Australia is the only country outside of the US to operate the Growler. An Australian initiative in conjunction with the United States is the development of a loyal wingman class stealthy multi-role unmanned aerial vehicle, a UAV. The MQ-28 Ghostbat is designed as a force multiplier aircraft, capable of flying alongside crewed aircraft and performing autonomous missions independently. It utilises a modular mission package where the entire nose can be removed and quickly swapped out with another package uh, with various mission suits, including reconnaissance and electronic warfare. The aircraft is planned to have a 900 nautical mile or 1,700 kilometre combat radius. It will fly in the high subsonic flight regime and, according to Boeing, have fighter-like manoeuvrability. At this stage, the MQ-28 Ghostbat 
is designed for ISR and tactical early warning. Whether this involves into a kinetic combat capability is not yet clear. Powered by a commercial turbofan engine, it is designed to be and will be operated as expendable and replaceable. The current planned introduction to service is 2024 to 2025. Often missed as combat aircraft are uh, the armed maritime patrol aircraft, and for Australia, these are the P-8A Poseidon. They are armed with anti-ship missiles, currently the Harpoon, and anti-submarine lightweight torpedoes. The RAAF is the major non-US operator of this aircraft, and these aircraft will be major contributors to the new focus on maritime and littoral operations to the north of Australia. To arm these aircraft, the RAAF employs the following weapons. For the air-to-air -air mission, the short-range AIM-9 Sidewinder and the long-range AIM-120 AMRAM. For air-to-ground, the AGM-88 Harm anti-radiation missile. The AGM-154 JSO or Joint Standoff Weapon, which is it's not a missile, but a, a glide bomb with a weight of 500 kilograms or 1,100 pounds and a range of between 22 and 130 kilometres, depending on release altitude. Now, this is joined with, with a range of other smaller glide bombs. And the AGM-158 Bravo Extended Range Joint Air-to-Service Standoff Missile, the JSON. For the Air to Maritime Domain, the AGM-158 Charlie Long Range uh, Anti-Ship Missile is a stealthy anti-ship cruise missile which is derived from the AGM-158 Bravo, and has a range of 500 nautical miles or 925 kilometres, and is armed with a 450 kilogram or 1,000 pound warhead. The DSR has called for these weapons to be integrated on the F-35 and the F-A-18F. The DSR also called for the acquisition of the Joint Strike Missile, the JSM, which is an air launch derivative of the Naval Strike Missile, the NSM, which Australia has purchased to replace the Harpoon anti-ship missile on its surface combatant force. Importantly, these are designed to be carried internally on the F-35A. Uh, its range is between 185 and 550 kilometres, depending on launch altitude. To make the most out of these combat aircraft, you need force multipliers, which can include airborne early warning and control aircraft and air refueling aircraft that enable the combat aircraft to stay on station for longer, to conduct operations further away, and to increase their situational awareness. Key for air refuelers is how much fuel they can offload and at what distance. Key for the airborne early warning and control aircraft is the detection range, and against how many targets they can detect, and the ability to detect targets with a small radar cross-section. The RAAF were the lead operators of the E7A Wedgetail Airborne Early Warning and Control Aircraft, which is based on a modified Boeing 737 airframe. It has a fixed, active, electronically scanned radar located in a dorsal fin rather than a rotating dome. The radar is capable of simultaneous air and sea search and fighter control with a maximum range of over 600 kilometres. In addition, the radar antenna array can also be used as an e-lint array with a maximum range of over 850 kilometres. The RAAF were also the launch customer for the KC-30A multi-role tanker transport which is based on a modified Airbus A330 airframe. The KC-30, with a maximum fuel capacity of 111,000 kilograms, 145,000 pounds, without the use of additional uh, fuel tanks, leaving space for 45,000 kilograms or 99,000 pounds of additional cargo. It is fitted with both probe and drogue and flying boom refueling capability. It can offload 65,000 kilograms or 143,000 pounds of fuel at 1,000 nautical miles or 1,850 kilometres with two hours at that station. 
Other force multipliers include the MC55A Peregrine, a modified Gulfstream G550, which is used for SIGIN and ELINT gathering. Another is the MQ4C Triton, a high altitude, long endurance UAV, which is based on the RQ4 uh, Global Hawk and is employed as an intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance aircraft. It will conduct real time ISR missions over the ocean and littoral regions together with search and rescue missions. Uh, it will work closely with the, the P8 Poseidon Maritime Patrol aircraft but with the ability to remain on station for significantly longer time and to direct the P-8s onto targets. I'll briefly touch on transport aircraft as I'll be covering them in a future briefing. The C-17 is the premier transport aircraft in the West and for its size, the RAAF operates a large number. It can carry a 77 ton payload, which could include an Abrams tank or two Boxer reconnaissance vehicles, or two M142 HIMARS multiple launch rocket systems, or two Bushmaster protected mobility vehicles. Australia also operates 12 C-130J Hercules transport aircraft. Now these are the workhorses of the RAAF's air mobility capability, and can carry a 20 ton payload. The RAF operates the stretch version of the C-130J, with a longer cargo area allowing for more smaller vehicles or pallets to be carried. Australia also operates the Mini Herc or, or Baby Herc, the C27A Spartan. It fills an important role where a CH47 Chinook helicopter may not have the speed and or range or where the capacity of a C130 would be wasted. However, there are some issues with the aircraft. The Air Force has redesigned the role of the C-27J airlifters, designating them as primarily meant for use in Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster Relief, or HADR, operations. So the RAAF's aircraft inventory includes, for combat aircraft, building to 72 ordered F-35A Lightning II fighter strikes, 24 FA-18F multi-role aircraft, 12 EA-18G Growler electronic warfare aircraft, and soon to be 14 P-8A Poseidon maritime patrol aircraft. In terms of transport capability, eight C-17As, currently 12, but moving to 20 C-130J Hercules, and 10 C-27Js. In terms of enablers, six E7A airborne early warning and control aircraft, soon to be four MC55A Peregrines, seven KC30A multi-role tanker transports, and six MQ4C high altitude long endurance UAVs. The Air Force is all, will also have 10 MQ-28 Ghost Bats. Uh, some sources say 13, but it is actually 10. Now, while initially they'll be used as intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance and tactical early warning, they may further evolve into a kinetic combat strike capability. In terms of weapons, as mentioned, the AM-9 Sidewinder and AM-120 AMRAM for air-to-air -air roles AGM-88 Harm anti-radiation, AGM-154 Joint Standoff Weapon Glide Bomb, and the AGM-158 Bravo Extended Range JASM. For maritime targets, the AGM-158 Charlie Long Range Anti-Ship Missile, potentially the Joint Strike Missile replacing the Harpoon, and the Mark 54 Lightweight Torpedo. And the Air Force also operates 33 Hawk 127 training aircraft. Which bases might these aircraft operate out of? Well, some are already stationed in Northern Air Bases, while others will need to redeploy. 
These air bases include, from west to east, uh, Cocos Keeling Island, Curtin in the north of uh, Western Australia, Darwin Tyndall in the north of uh, Central Australia, and Sugar and Townsville in the north of Eastern Australia. Any of the aircraft might also operate from the US Air Base on the island of Guam. In summary, the Royal Australian Air Force will be optimised to support the Navy and Army in maritime and littoral operations, and not designed for deep strike on an adversary's homeland. Given this, it is not surprising Australia did not seek to acquire the B-21 Raider strategic bomber. Nothing in the Defence Strategic Review means that the Royal Australian Air Force can't or won't operate further afield than the area of primary defence interest, but this area is the focus for operational planning. Over the recent past, the Royal Australian Air Force has demonstrated astute platform selection being the first customer for a number of capabilities that have gone on to see widespread service. It will be interesting to see how the MQ-28 Ghost Bat evolves, both in terms of capabilities and other potential users. While a small force, the RAAF is equipped with leading edge capabilities and trains in the most sophisticated environments. How it might perform against a peer or near peer adversary remains to be seen. Although beyond the scope of this briefing, a critical shortfall for the RAAF is the availability of aircrew to maintain high operational tempo for its combat aircraft. Increased aircrew numbers would allow for a higher tempo, something that will be needed against a peer or near peer adversary. That concludes today's briefing. Thank you for watching. Happy to take suggestions for future briefings from subscribers, so please subscribe, like and share. Until next time. Fala de Sarah.